Yeah, so this is the fun stuff. All right. All right, friends and fam. We can begin. We've got a nice uh, amount of friends here already. I'm very humbled and honored that you are here with us today. So without further ado, let's, let's just kick it off. Let's get it started. Let's do a unit management class. So to kind of lay the groundwork, I wanted to explain why I chose unit management as the title. Because some of you are probably out there like, you're probably out there like, what? why is it a unit management class? Unit management? What is unit management? Well, unit management, a lot of times it, it comes out as micro. The word we use, the word that we use in the StarCraft community when we're talking about the way that units move on the map is micro. How good is your micro? How fast are you with your splits and all this like, fine tune bane link focus fire and that kind of stuff your micro your micro micro is a really key and amazing aspect of starcraft and it's perhaps the most flashy element as well it's the one that really catches your eye when you're watching the gsl code s players like beyond doing amazing splits and stuff with his terran units you see all these different bane link run buys splitting stuff and it's all very impressive but when I'm casting games on my Saturdays from the viewers of my stream, we've got people from bronze all the way up to... I'm going to mute the audio. Bronze all the way up to Master League who are missing the point of a lot of what unit management constitutes. It's not just about that endpoint of fancy mouse control and moving your units around. The reason I chose unit management is because a lot of these outcomes of the battles in your games are decided not on your fancy micro, but they're decided more on other elements. So let's take a look at some of those other elements that lead into really solid macro play. Boom. StarCraft Fundamentals Unit Management, let's go. I hope everyone brought their, uh, their copy of Sun Tzu Art of War. We're gonna be quoting some stuff from him. A lot of these principles are very old principles and ones that we should be super aware of in our games. So fun tagline up there. Unit management, we're optimizing the performance of every piece. So we're trying to make our units do their jobs well. What elements are there to unit management? We've got rallying, which is about getting units to where they need to go and knowing where the key areas are on the map that we need to put our units. So rallying, and then we've got organization. Organization is how we're gonna be managing our control groups and our roles. One of the things that really makes your units more successful is if you have clear jobs for each of them. It's not just like a bunch of armed soldiers just standing on the map looking up in the sky like, okay, now what? When they're made, you should know who they're working with you should understand their team. You should understand what their team is trying to do because that's gonna make them a lot more directed, a lot faster, and a lot more successful. The third element is position. A lot of armies can succeed really, really well if you put them in the right position on the map. If they're on, say, a high ground area. If they have, say, a concave to the opponent. Position is a big factor in the success of your units. The fourth one is formation. This is probably the one that ends up messing up players the most. It makes me very sad because you have this theme, right? You have this theme of the person who understands that StarCraft is a game of skill, and they understand that having the bigger army is an advantage, but then what they'll do is they'll take their army, their huge army, in one clump like a small children's soccer game and they will move the army through a narrow choke uphill toward the opponent who has splash damage of some kind. Maybe it's disruptors or storm or lurkers or what have you, siege tanks. And their entire army gets decimated. They just get annihilated. And the first thing they do is post to Reddit about how disruptors are too strong. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. You put the units in the absolute worst formation for assaulting the opponent's base. We're gonna look at a really easy procedure to make your formation crisp and clean 
where the units get to represent themselves in a successful fashion, not in the clumped up fashion that High Templar dream about. And then the fifth element here, and it's important that this is the last element, is micro. A lot of people with unit management, like I said before, they think of micro as the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth elements of unit management. That it's all about micro. That if I'm in gold and I can't get to platinum, uh, I'm just not microing hard enough. It's really not. It's really not what you need to be focusing on at all. If you're rallying, your organization, position, and formation are all sound for the type of army that you have, you shouldn't really need to micro that much. Micro should be about small adjustments when the fight is happening, rather than, oh my goodness, suddenly banelings, all of my marines were like this, and now I need to do perfect splits. It's not realistic. All right, so let's move into rallying. So rallying is what is the directing of new troops. We have new stuff being made. This could be units that fight, or it could be workers, or it could be overlords. <clears throat> so concentrating strength. They should be pointed toward key areas on the map. One of the themes of StarCraft is there are a lot of areas that come up as really crucial game after game after game. You've got stuff like the areas between your bases. The areas between your bases end up being a pressure point that opponents hit with timings really, really often. So what you can do is just set your rally point whenever you're building your new units say anything that is being born into the game go to this area between my second and third base and then oftentimes there will be an attack or a run by of some kind and they just run into your rallied units that are just standing there but they're standing at a really crucial spot so that's another key element of unit management worker rally is something that we can show in a demo here in a second but Every town hall structure, if you don't already know, this is kind of a beginner tip. Most people who play the game pretty often know this. You want to be clicking your town hall and then clicking a mineral patch because you can just spam workers and then the workers will naturally go and fulfill some role of harvesting minerals for you so you can make more stuff over time. Let's just crack open a game here. We're going to be starting and stopping this a little bit so I can show each different element of unit management. I'm not going to be playing against an opponent. I don't even need an AI to do this. This is just about showing how the pieces move in the game. We've had lots of content on build orders, on production, on composition, on scouting. This is all about how to make the units move properly in the game, which is hard. It's a hard game. It's okay to take things slow. I would recommend for a lot of these basic aspects. Wow, I feel victorious. So the nice thing about the game is this rally point already starts for you. The hatch is already directed toward the base. The other rally point for Zerg is your hatch is also your barracks and your gateway. So any new fighting units are gonna naturally go to the second rally point. And this is a smart setup, right? Where if you click a worker patch, it moves your orange line, which is your worker line, to that patch, not your white line. Your white line moves anytime you click ground that is not some kind of harvesting area. See a Vespine geyser? That counts as a harvesting area, so this is moving your worker rally to that point. So cool, we've got our, our rally set up here. What was I talking about before with the crucial areas on the map and rallying? Look at this. This is the main base. You see this? This is our second base. You could say that right here ends up being a crucial pressure point in a lot of scenarios. Say you're in Zerg versus Zerg, and the enemy Zerg tries to send a crap ton of Ling Bane up in this area. So if you happen to have some Lings on the ramp, that could catch a lot of those threats moving through. Looking here, the second base to a third base location. A lot of times the enemy will try to charge up this ramp here and attack into here. So if you had these three bases, you can just rally all of them right here to this point. And you're making roaches, you're making zealots, you're making marines, whatever. And they're just naturally standing at a really key point on the map. 
So that's kind of how we're we're looking at rallying, right? That's how we're looking at rallying. We're looking at where our structures are leading our new units and we're directing that in a purposeful way. It's okay to not know all of this from the outset. We learn a lot of times by trial and error, but this kind of investigation is trying to find the basic fundamental principles, which if you boil it down enough, it seems like, oh yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's obvious. But these games that we play are very frantic. They're frantic because our opponent is sending reapers and lings and adepts into our bases all the time. So it's hard to really remember all of those simple things where you go to Sun Tzu Art of War and it's like, oh yeah, I mean, this has been obvious for thousands of years. But with all the chaos of battle and I'm getting cannon rushed and all this, we forget some of it. So this is a nice reminder. We talk a little bit about the optimal mining setup. They did fix the uh, number readout on your mineral patch. Actually, I can show you this in the game. Let's talk a little bit about optimizing workers on the mineral line. Let's go to that mineral line. This seems fun. Okay, here's our mineral line here. Let's go to the main. So we're in the main. Let's just look at these patches. We've got patches that are a little bit closer and a little bit further away. If you wanna be fancy pants, super high level, there's a small optimization here on your mining rate. If you put the workers on the close patches before the long patches. This is something that if you're probably anywhere from bronze to diamond, this is not gonna affect your win rate in any way. Probably not even masters. But if you're bored and you wanna learn more about how the game works, you can do stuff like this. You can put the workers on the close patches before the long ones. And the reason that that mines faster is because of a shorter trip. You just go over here, mine, as opposed to a few extra milliseconds to the long patches. So you've got that relationship in the mineral line. There is sometimes a difference in the distance between these Vespian geysers, but it's so minimal that I feel like it's not really worth mentioning too much. So look at this number here. You got 12 out of 16. Let's talk about that a little bit. 16 is the most optimal worker count where you've got two workers per patch. You can exceed that by a little bit. Someone was actually mentioning this at the start of the stream today. You can exceed it by a little bit and you only lose a tiny bit of efficiency. So let's drone this base up just a little bit, say to 16, then we can see what that looks like. And then we could do it even a little bit further and see how that works. This one needs to be rallied too. Great. Cool, so now we have perfect saturation. This is optimal. There's no downtime. The drones, as soon as they get to the patch, they can happily mine. None of the drones are running around in different areas. Everything is peaceful and tranquil and wonderful right now. So let's see what happens when we make three more workers. Just making three more workers here. What we want to do is put them to the long patches. Again, this is another thing that is kind of advanced. It's not really gonna change your win rate that much, but it does help a little bit. So you see this drone here. He's a little bit confused. He just went from one patch to the other and they were both busy. So a little bit of time is wasted, but see, we found a new equilibrium. They're only wasting a tiny bit of time. You're still getting about 90% efficiency. This number is red, but 19 out of 16 is not too bad. 13 out of 16 is bad. Say we have this set up here in the main. Why is this bad? I would say this is bad because you're not utilizing the full value of a base. A base is a really amazing asset because the longer this is mining, you can afford more tech, more upgrades, more units, lots of different stuff. So you might as well capitalize on the resources that are there. If you have defended the location and you're also not going for a huge attack. Sometimes you do have a build where you do one and a half base saturation or two base saturation with a certain number of gases. But in general, if you plan to move through the early, mid and late game, you wanna get at least 16, maybe 18 workers on the mineral patches. So there you go. There you go. 
If you put a spore or something in the patch's air defense, wouldn't it make the drones a tad bit longer way back? Actually, that's actually a super good thing to point out. So if you're looking at putting static in the worker line, this applies to all three races. This could be a photon cannon or a missile turret or a spore crawler. Generally, you want to put it in such a place that it's not going to block any of the patches, and you want to have it either in the middle or next to your hatchery. The drones are in probes and SCVs are pretty smart about moving around stuff, but if it is physically blocked here, then they'll have to go around to the back of the patch. Usually you would just put the piece of static defense kind of in the center, because usually it has a radius like this that it can protect. So you put it here and it protects that. If you want to go ham, you could put more static D kind of around here, and here is another pretty common static defense formation where you're able to protect your geysers, and then you end up protecting this mineral line by these two overlapping static pieces. So here's the example there. Two spores, this is gonna protect you against like mass banshee or mutas, that kind of stuff. And if your placement is good, you don't need to go to bananas with all the different static defense. You wanna have actual live units that can attack your opponent later on. A little bit of a tangent, but I think that's a good thing to point out. It's fairly relevant here. Sweet. So we did the worker rally, uh, Terran Protoss construction. This is a, a pretty key thing to figure out too, because a lot of times you've got a worker and this worker is given a task. You say, hey, SCV, go build a barracks. And he's like, okay. So he goes over there and he builds a barracks. And then the barracks finishes, and he's just like this. He's just standing there. Because he doesn't have the next directed purpose, right? He's a hired unit, but if you don't have a job for him, he'll just stand there. He doesn't he didn't care. I don't have to work now. So what you want to do, if you want to get some value, because you have to pay the SCV to work for you, right? You say SCV, build a barracks, and then go get minerals again. So you send the unit to build the structure, and then you shift right click the worker patch. So you give them two jobs, not one. You give them a queue of sorts. And that saves you a lot of time later because you unify it into one step. You don't have to remember, oh, the, the worker finished its task. I need to go grab that until to go do something. You can just queue up the command, makes it a lot simpler. This applies to Protoss as well, where you can take one probe and you can say, build a pylon, and then hold down shift, build a barracks, not a barracks, they can't build barracks, build a gateway, build a gateway, build a gateway, build a gateway, and then you can gateway all in, and it's amazing. And then go back to mine minerals, right? Because you wanna make sure they're always doing something. Workers are super valuable. They're kind of like the unsung heroes of the game, in my opinion. I think they're the most underrated unit by the community, so, you should really place a key emphasis on knowing what your workers are doing and trying to optimize their function. Because we, like I was saying with the micro earlier, we tend to focus on the flashy unit control of StarCraft as opposed to the, they're kind of like the linebackers, the ones that do that job that it's not quite as glamorous, but it's equally important to the flashy micro. You can't have an amazing army to micro if you don't have a good economy, if you don't have good infrastructure. So value your workers, let it be known. So let's look at the idle workers function in the game. This is a really cool tool. Let's go into the match. What happens if, oh no, David Kim save us. It's the liberators. So I had to pull my drones away and then I move my spore. Ah, oh, go away you heckin liberator. And now I have a bunch of idle workers. Do you see this button? This is the idle worker button. And if you click it, or if you press the key, it takes you and cycles through all of the idle workers in the game. But the fun thing is you can press control, hold down control on your keyboard, and then press the button, and it selects all idle workers in the game. I didn't even have to box that. I could box this, but say I had idle workers over here, I had workers over here, I had a worker or two over here, and it's not physically possible for me to box all of this. 
I hold down control, I press that key, I have to wait. I have to wait for these to get over there. Hang on. Stand by. Okay, they made it. Control, hit the key, boom, go back to work. And then all of them go back to doing some work. Wonderful. What an amazing tool that is. Thank you. Pause. I think that does it for rallying. And I even show you there in the, the notes how to get to that hotkey. Mine is bound to B. I don't know what hotkey setup you use. This is not a mechanics class where we're going to talk about the most ideal hotkey layouts. I use the core. There's also grid. There's also standard. Whatever. You can figure that out. I'll show you where it is, though. So options, hotkeys, global, unit management, idle worker. This bad boy right there. Oops. I was tabbed out. Idle worker right here. So it's hotkeys, global, you see this? You see this, idle worker, unit management, perfect. Perfect. You should set that, you should set this, warp in. We'll touch on this a little bit later. So sweet. We have learned how to manage those workers somewhat. What a wonderful time. Let's talk about the eggs of the Zerg. Zerg has the least intuitive mechanics, I think, from a RTS perspective. If you're looking at Terran, a lot of the structures and functions of Terran buildings is pretty similar to just real world military, like a barracks. There are barracks. Tanks. Tanks exist in the real world. So a lot of that process, it makes sense. You build a structure, the workers go back and do something else. Whereas with Zerg, stuff is a little bit different. You've got like, everything is organic and you actually birth the units rather than train them. So let's look at the, the egg function for Zerg. You have larva, which is the undifferentiated Zerg unit. A larva doesn't know what it's gonna be until you tell it to be born into the game as something. But it could be anything, basically anything of Zerg. So I'll show you this process. You're going to select the hatches, bound to a control group, hold down the hotkey for the unit, shift in control group to add it, and then set the rally point for the new units. So let's do that. Let's do that. Unpause. Unpause. Let's build some hatches first. Just build some hatches. That'll allow us to make more stuff. This is not an actual build that I'm doing. If you see this massive bank, that's not the point of this class at all. I'm not trying to show you a build. I'm not trying to show off. We're trying to learn the very basic principles of how StarCraft II Legacy of the Void works. So we've got all these bases, all of these bases. Let's make overlords. So you see this, I have three eggs here. I just held down the overlord key. Now let's rally these overlords somewhere. We could put one here and then I'm going to hold down shift and click the eggs. So now I have two overlords selected. I'm going to put one here because sometimes drops come this way. And now I'm just going to click one of these overlords. So I have the last one and I'm going to move it here to this little high ground area so I can see any big, huge marine tank attacks that are going to smash into my base. So cool. I've got hatches now, got hatches, got hatches for days. I've got hatches and I've got more hatches. Let's make some queens, couple drones. And then we're gonna be rallying some units and having fun with that. So these, these hatches need some queens. And everything here, all of the hatches are on the same hotkey. So the basic mechanic for this, very simple basic Zerg stuff, is I select my hatches, <clears throat> I select my larva, and then I hold down the Zerg button. A lot of people make fun of Zerg for just spamming the Z key or whatever your Zergling key is, but that's just, that's just what Zerg is. That's what Zerg does. So I made all these units, and then I held down Shift, and I put them in a control group. So these lings are all in a control group, and I can move them wherever I want to, 
When they come out, that's great. Look at them go. That's wonderful. The Eximin Rally. There was a very smart person in the Reddit thread for this class who said, Neuro, and I was like, what? Neuro, what? And they said, sometimes Zerg gets some larva in their group. Say you select your hatch as your larva, you make some lings, and then you make some lings, but then you accidentally add some larva. Ugh. I added larva to my control group. That's annoying. I didn't mean for that to happen. Because now if I make overlords, then they'll be added to this group. Or if I make drones, they'll be added to this group. Ugh. So what you can do is get to the page with these larva, and you hold down both control and shift, and then you click. Boom. Magic. Did you see that? But they're not gone forever. You have to rebind the group. So you're going to do control and then rebind the group. So now the larvae are gone. They're deselected and they can just lie happily on the floor and they won't be pulled around the map with these links. Magic. It is worth mentioning the page up, page down feature. It's uh, these buttons. You can click these pages or these are also in your hotkeys. I'm not exactly sure where that is. Page up, page down. Options, hotkeys. Let's investigate this. <clears throat> Control groups. Is it this? It might be in unit management. It might be. Yeah, next subgroup. That's what that's called. This can be really useful if you are a, say, Tarn player and you have all your production on one hotkey. So you have your barracks, your factories, your starports. They're all in the same key. You can use this next subgroup feature to cycle through those. So if you start with your barracks, you go next, that'll take you to your factories. You go next, that'll take you to your starports. Sweet. <clears throat> you tab for standard. Yeah, tab is, I think, the default key for that. Superb. Superb. So we did the rallying the eggs as Zerg, warping in as Protoss. So this is a fun thing because it's a bit of an exception for how production works in StarCraft. Usually, you have your production bound to a control group, and then you select that group, so all your production is selected, and then you build units from that. Protoss is a very mysterious and advanced race in StarCraft, and they have what's called uh, warp gate technology, which is effectively teleportation. And who knows where they come from? It's kind of like just a general universe. Any Protoss are out there who are able to be warped in, there's a Zerg over here, we need to kill him with Zealots. So you just press a general like warp gate button, and all of your active warp gates in the game are a conduit for any zealots who are willing to fight Zerg in the present moment. It's not necessarily even from your gateways. They're just teleported from somewhere. And this is in a different location than the other hotkeys. We did see it a little bit before, but I'll show you again. Hotkeys, you would think Protoss, but it's in global. It's in unit management. Go to the top, warp in. It's got its own button. And this button does conflict with other stuff, even if you're playing a different race. You can't have this bound to something else without running into some problems. So you need a warp in key if you're Protoss. If you want to be fancy pants, you can do, what is it? Choose ability or AI target. This is the rapid fire stuff. There are lots of YouTube videos on that. I'm not going to go into that today, but <clears throat> it's really nice to rapid fire warp in some stuff so you could rapid fire and just hold down the key for your zealots and then wave your cursor around on the floor and all the zealots will be warped in super fast. This is within the rules. It's not cheating to use rapid fire. The pros do this. It just saves you a lot of time as opposed to having to click for every individual unit you want to make. You can't rapid fire all your units though so you want to make sure those are the units that you kind of want to mass out in large numbers, like your Zealots, your Adepts, your Stalkers, mostly your Gateway units. Stuff like High Templar and Dark Templar, usually you don't mass them, unless you're M-Canning. 
going for the mass DT thing. Oh god. <clears throat> okay. So strategy. Where you direct your troops depends on the game state. If you're aiming to secure a macro advantage with bases, workers, better tech, you'll rally new units to your newest base or the area between your two newest bases. If you attack, they can be rallied to reinforce your main army. And then, wow, a Sun Tzu quote. One who has few must prepare against the enemy. One who has many makes the enemy prepare against him. Let's crack this open and look at this. Boom. We're back in. Say we're going for a mass slow zergling attack. It, it Just because they're slow doesn't mean they can't still bite stuff. Their damage is the same. They just take their time. So now we have many. So we're going to attack the enemy. And since we're attacking, let's just hold down the zergling button. Add some stuff. And then we can rally this. Bear in mind that production facilities can't take attack commands. They only have move commands. So if you attack here, the eggs don't the eggs don't attack. They don't know to do that. So the new units will just go to that move rally point. So what you can do is you can have the units, have the eggs, and you can move, shift, attack. So we're here, we move command, and then we shift attack. That way, the units will move, and then by the time they're there, they're not going to be eggs anymore. Then they can take an attack command. So that's a nice little way of managing your attacks so they're very quick and ferocious and decisive. Rather than just a bunch of units being spawned randomly on the map without a clear purpose in life. Sweet. We've got egg rallying. Thank you, Korean Avatar. Strategy. Boom. Got this one. Nice. Organization. The management of many, as Sun Tzu said, is the same as the management of few. It is a matter of organization. Let's be honest. If we're in StarCraft, we have 200 supply, we have hundreds of things. Hundreds of things. Goodness. It feels like we're being buried in units and tasks and stuff to remember and manage. It's overwhelming for everyone not not just for people in low leagues been gm for like 15 seasons it's pretty overwhelming that's okay what we do to boil it down is we use control groups simple stuff control groups with clear jobs if you're new to the game maybe you start out with two you've got your production you've got your army maybe you've got your town hall structures on a different hotkey as well but you want to make that as streamlined, as simple as you can, so you have it all memorized, and then you can add in stuff. So instead of just having one army hotkey, one production hotkey, one town hall hotkey, you could have a harassment hotkey, where you have mutas, or phoenixes, or oracles, or banshees, or liberators, some other unit that has a separate job where they're moving on the map independently of the main army. You've got the main army, which kind of does the back and forth with your enemy. And then you've got special ops, like White Ross said, special tactics force that is separate from that, trying to accomplish some objectives on the map. So let's, let's take a look at that process in the game. Organization, great. Thank you for this pause. I'm gonna show you something very amazing. This is called the steel command. Watch this. Boom. You see this? I stole these units away to a different group. This was my main army hotkey, but now these happy little buddies are on a different hotkey. So they can have a separate job. And now I give the opponent two opportunities to fail. One is maybe they fail to defend this, or maybe they fail to defend this. And then what I can do is I can just pull back whichever side is not being successful. Oh, they're getting shot at. Run away. This is bad. Oh, but these guys are doing really well. Let's push in. So it makes you really fluid and dangerous in different areas if you're able to assign different roles and responsibilities. So instead of being like a, a one-dimensional back-and-forth kind of player, you can be fancy pants 
and have different strike teams that are going in and presenting threats on the map in different places. This is more in the advanced tier. If you're in uh, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamond, maybe maybe diamond you could try to start doing this or so. But yeah, stealing units. I'll show you where this hotkey is. Options, hotkeys, global, control groups. Oh my goodness. Do you see this? All of my create things are unbound. My select ones are not bound. All of my add things are unbound. What the? This is on purpose. Because I use these. Blizzard added these in Legacy of the Void for Archon mode. So that if you're playing with a buddy and you're sharing stuff, it makes sure you're not both pulling around the same units. If you take it and add it to your group, it takes it away from your allies group. But this is amazing for 1v1. Because it combines two key steps. Usually, a unit's going to have one job, right? You've got one Zergling. He's got like 20 teeth. I don't know how many, how many teeth do they have. They've got some claws. They're not going to be attacking two different bases at the same time. They're tiny. So they need to be in one job. One group, one job, one task, one thing to bite at a time. Generally speaking, you're not going to want to have multiple units in the same group that are also in a different group because they're kind of conflicted, right? It's like, who is who is my boss? Am I part of this group or am I part of that group? This makes it super clean. If you add a unit to a new group, it pulls it out of any other groups. So it's not going to be like torn from side to side of, I don't know if I should help them attack the fifth base or help them attack the second base. They'll only do one thing, which is fantastic. So I highly recommend this. You don't have to do this. Again, a lot of this stuff is recommendation based on my personal preference. A lot of people still use these. Some people use both. The default in the game is for the add commands, it's shift as your modifier and then the group. This is control. And then for these, it's alt. I can't remember which one. One of these is alt something. But yeah, it's, it's alt. Alt something. All of my stuff is customized. I don't know the defaults for a lot of this. Maybe someone in the chat knows. So sweet. We've got... We've got that going. Ah. We did this. Ah. Okay. We did the add, create. Add, steal, create, steal. Wonderful. Let's go to this. Ooh. We've even got some example setups for you here. Because I know a lot of people are just lost in the woods of like, okay, I understand it's important, but what? 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 It's okay. For Zerg, example setup. These don't need to be the numbers you use. This is just numbers of groups. You could say maybe your hatches are on four instead of three. I don't care. But the idea is you want a control group for your army. Unless you're going to F2 all the way to GM, which you can do. There are people who do this. It's okay. It has its downsides, but you can do that. Casters or harassment, as a second idea, most of the casters, well, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them don't have a physical auto attack. Ravens, Vipers, Infestors, High Templar, they added one, mainly just so they don't go into the fray of the army, but their auto attack is terrible. Um, but yeah, a lot of times they don't have an auto attack, so you don't want them to just run in front of the army. If you give a group an attack command and you have casters in the group, they will move command to where the army is going, which can sometimes cause, say, your vipers to fly over the enemy army and get killed. So what I like to do is have them on a different group, they're independent, and I tell them to, say, follow a hydra. You just follow the hydra you vipers that way they're going to kind of naturally be in the back of the army setup they're not going to zoom ahead once the hydra gets to the army you can just click the viper key and then blinding cloud blinding cloud blinding cloud or abduct whatever you have to do another key one for zerg hatcheries obviously we need those on a hot key and then queens there are a bunch of different methods for managing your queens and it's one of the biggest areas of Zerg skill. 
you've got some methods where they go rapid fire, inject, you've got camera location hotkey inject, there's some zergs I think you do minimap inject. I'm not going to tell you what to do for that. You can do what you like. I use camera locations. You could use the base camera. I'll show you that real fast. Hotkeys, uh, global camera. So I use the create location and jump to location. There's also the base camera, which I actually have unbound. I'm not even using that. But I think that's backspace by default. A lot of people use space bar for that. And what that does is it has all of your town hall structures in a list and it cycles to the next one. So that's probably the simplest way to jump around your town hall structures. Bear in mind if you're Zerg or really any race, this will take you to town hall structures that are not at a mineral patch. Say that you built a defensive planetary fortress, that counts. So if you're cycling through with base camera, it will take you to those planetaries or to your macro hatch. So be aware of that. The reason I don't use this is because it takes away some control from me because I can use the jump options for defense. Say I look on the mini map out of the corner of my eye and I see a huge doom drop, eight medivacs full of a bunch of angry Terran units and they're gonna drop my main. I can just jump to location one. I don't need to spam my space bar and hope that it takes me to my main first. And if it doesn't, or if I go past it, then I have to go around again. That can cause some, uh, some trouble for you. So what I like to do here, it gives me a lot more control. I just go exactly where I need to go by pressing that hotkey. Or it's a combo in this case, I guess. Okay. Scout, having an overlord on a group is super smart. Overlords and overseers are very brave units. You shouldn't really be afraid to send them into the enemy base. It's like a, a bold way for them to express themselves and to get to see something amazing. And you know that an overlord, they're going to be honored to get that key scout of what the opponent is up to. A lot of people are very kind of hesitant and scared with their overlords, but I think of them as a pay to remove where you zoom it into the base and that overlord just like, Check it out, check it out, look what I see. And you can use that knowledge to win the game a lot of times or be in a good spot. So put those on a hotkey. It makes the use of them really fast. I'll give you an example here of jumping to it. Say we have, say we have Overlord on a hotkey. Let's grab this guy. Let's grab this guy. We just put him on a hotkey. So I'm going to send him. And then I'm going to look away from this overlord. Say I'm injecting my bases happily. Look at this. Wow. I just queued up a bunch of shift injects, and they're going to inject away. Another little pro tip for you. Look at them go. Wow. So now, instead of dragging my camera across the map to try and find the overlord, I can just do this. Boom. We got to the overlord. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. We're following him. You can also click this and follow if you're trying to be silly and just enjoy the graceful passage of an overlord over the map, over the lings and stuff. But yeah, get your overlords on a hotkey. This guy's on a hotkey too. This guy's on a hotkey. Thank you, Abathur. Okay. <clears throat> Protoss. A lot of this stuff is similar. Main army. Derp, derp, derp. Casters or harassment. High Templar, Oracles, Phoenixes, Nexus, Production. Like I said with the Warp Gates, those don't need to be on a hotkey. So you can free up that control group for other stuff. Maybe Warp Prism. Warp Prism is a super good thing to have on a hotkey. And then five, you've got uh, Oracle or Observer. I do want to show you something called Oversight. I think that's what it's called for Overseers. I'm not sure what it's called for the other units, but let's get some gas and get a lair real fast. Let's get a lair. Look at this. Let's get a lair. And I'll show you a new thing that they added. I think this was during Legacy of the Void that they added this, and it's actually really strong and really good to be aware of this. 
I believe the reason they put it into the game is because of the use of the all army function. I'm not super certain, but it has other uses as well. They did make this like a legit thing that even the top players use. It's not just something to make it easier on new players, but I think it does. So we'll get a lair with 100 gas, and then I'm going to make an overseer. Excuse me. Excuse me, we're not, we're not looking at it. There was nothing useful for you to see there. It was probably really boring anyway. Okay. Superb. So the lair is going, and then we're going to make some overseers. Let's make some overseers. Take some overlord speed. Tell him. Tell him, Abathur. Okay. So lair is going. Overlay. Yeah. The struggle. It doesn't always pick up when you tab over to the other monitor. Sometimes it does. It's not perfect. It's 2018, but the world is not perfect yet. We still got some work to do. Okay, lair. The lair only feels like it's taking a really long time when the next step in your class is hinged entirely upon the completion of the lair. Okay. Let's make two overseers. Two overseers here. And I do have overlord speed, which to quote day nine, allows them to travel at rocket ship speed. Okay, so we've got two rocket ships here. And look at this button. This is new. Grants the Overseer 25% wider vision, but removes its ability to move. This ability can be cancelled after activation. So we have this guy, let's push that button. So it flies up, and it stops. And the vision radius is greater, the detection is greater as well, I believe. So the cool thing about this is, even if I have this selected, it won't move. If I F2, it won't move. So. For new players, if you're using the all army button, this saves you from sacrificing some key vision that you wanted on the map. Say you wanted to always have this overseer outside the enemy base like this, just to watch if they're moving out. You can put it into the oversight mode, and then you're using your F2, maybe that's your favorite button in the game, and you're running your army around, it won't compromise this location. Additionally, since it provides more vision, it can be really useful for attacks. Say you're trying to push into someone with lurkers, or some stealth units, or you just want to see more of their army. This expands your vision radius, which is cool. It is worth noting that you can still spawn changelings and contaminate from this state. You can still cast spells with these guys. Observers have a similar thing. I don't remember what it's called, but they have effectively the same button where they're rooted and their vision increases. I don't think any Terran units have this. Terran has scan. That's your that's your ticket to seeing everything that's on the map, just so you know. So we're pausing this. Terran, army casters, harassment, command centers, uh, production, scouting. We've covered everything in this uh, section. Magnificent. Okay, position. Sun Tzu, long ago, said, When troops gain a favorable situation, the coward is brave. If it be lost, the brave becomes cowards. In the art of war, there are no fixed rules. These can only be worked out according to circumstances. So basically, that's a very lofty way of saying, if you put the units in a place where they can be successful, they're going to take charge of the situation, and they're going to kick some butt. If you put them into a situation where it's going to be terrible for them, and they're about to get annihilated, they're going to look really bad and unsuccessful. So a big part of your unit management is putting them into a place, a geographical on-the-map place, where they can be successful. Sometimes, on paper, you have the better army. You have more stuff. You have higher army value, you have better upgrades, you have almost every advantage in the game, but you jam the units into such a horrible corridor that you get a, a 300 kind of situation where they only have like two units, but they're at a point that you can't reach and a huge chunk of your army gets blasted apart 
and then the enemy gets some reinforcements, and then suddenly you're losing. That's when your army value is spiked up really high and then you just lose a bunch of stuff. So be aware, just because you have the bigger army doesn't necessarily mean that that army is going to win every fight everywhere. You should know the lay of the land. Am I attacking uphill? Generally, that's kind of dangerous. You should be aware. Another question would be, could I manage my army a little bit differently? Could I get a different kind of angle of attack here? You have a bunch of options on the map. So attacking doesn't always mean that you're trying to pounce onto the enemy's army. A lot of it comes down to controlling key areas on the map, critical space, space that the opponent wants to control for themselves. We've got examples here for you. We've got the area between the bases. We talked about this. Basically, the area between the bases is really crucial because they want to be able to transfer workers and army from the first base, second base, to third base, to fourth base. A lot of times they're transferring drones, probes, and SCVs, and they're just kind of wandering over to the fresh base so they can start harvesting there. That's great. So if you have a timing, if you command that position, that puts a really big amount of pressure on the opponent to clear that up. Another example is using high ground. High ground has the advantage of vision over the opponent, unless they have an air unit providing some similar high ground. Let's look on the map here at some example kind of scenarios. Let's just get a, a Roach Warren and a Hydra Den, just so we have some different units to show you. Here, I'll use that idle worker button. Cool. So say this is the enemy's base. They've got these bases here. They have this base, they have this base, and they have this base. So what are my options here for attacking? I can attack through this narrow corridor. This is generally a super dangerous position. If they have this area sieged up and defended, you're probably going to get destroyed if you go up this way. Because you have to go uphill and then suddenly, oh goodness, there's a huge army. Maybe, maybe be careful about that. Another option is over here. This is just even ground. Where you're going from one elevation to the same elevation. And the danger comes from maybe there are units up here that can shoot down at you. One thing to be really aware of. Rocks. These rocks are blocking part of this path, but I can destroy them. If I so choose to. And that can open up a lot of opportunities. Because more of your units can pass through here at a given time. It increases the speed at which you can travel from one place to another and either defend against the opponent or attack. A lot of Terran timings revolve around, say this is my base. Let's say that this is my base here. I have this as my third. They'll park a couple siege tanks here, just siege them up, and then just blast the crap out of your area and then have a bunch of bio pre-split over here to protect those tanks. So if you break the rocks, it makes it a lot harder for them to set that up because they don't have the same protection. They had this little L shape protecting their tanks, but now it's just one little side here. So we could run in and deny those attacks or we could attack in. A good time to go for that is whenever you have some idle units, say you're droning up your third base and you don't have enough army to attack the opponent with a bunch of stuff. So you can just use your units to kill some rocks. Depending on your composition, you don't always want to do this. If you are the Terran with the siege tanks, usually the rocks are gonna be beneficial for you because it funnels the Zerg through this choke. So you wanna have your siege stuff here and then blow them up when they attack you. So you wanna leave those rocks there, that's fine. That's fine. But you should be aware that the rocks are a pretty big aspect of how a lot of these engagements play out. We're just on Lost and Found right now. This has the rocks that you can destroy or not. Some maps have what are called cooling towers or the rock towers. With those, they're like rocks that are at a vertical formation. And if you attack them, they collapse down and close a path. And then they become the destructible rocks that you could break through and then go for an attack. That's another thing that you can use to your advantage or to your opponent's detriment depending on what the game state looks like. Okay, we did those. 
Uh, base siege. Yeah, controlling an area just outside the opponent's base. One of the classic ways to create a really good engagement is to set up just outside the enemy's base at a point where you're not directly putting your units at risk, like at threat of their planetary shooting you, for example. But it's enough that you can agitate them into attacking into you. This is a really classic thing that you see in Zerg versus Terran, where Terran gets a big army and they set up kind of outside one of the Zerg's bases, where they can't actually even shoot the hatchery from where they are, but they're close and the Zerg is just like, ah! And they feel like I need to go attack this because these Marines, they come up and they go, Bleh! and it agitates my queen. My queen wants to chase those. My Ling Bane wants to chase those. And then it gets led into the tank line, which blasts the army apart. So sieging a base doesn't always necessarily mean that you take your long range units and you go and attack the town hall structure. Sometimes it means you just put them in a place where it incentivizes the opponent to move out and contest you in that area, which can give you a really, really good position. So a reinforcement line is another one to be aware of. If the opponent is going for a siege with a parade push, say they have new units just streaming across the map, streaming across the map, building up this huge siege that's outside your base, you can take some units and say, all right, I don't want to fight that, and I know that you want me to fight that. So I'm going to take my army, and I'm going to go around you, and I'm going to pick off that individual siege tank that's driving across the map. Those individual units that are just, just hustling across, but they're not really in a good place to be successful in a fight, they're traveling. So you go and cut that supply line so their army doesn't continue to grow. Sometimes you can sweep the siege if you have an overwhelming number and you take two angles of attack or something. But if you can't, then you can always go for the reinforcement line, or you can go for a run by and attack them. Okay. Formation. Oh my goodness. This is probably the golden goose for a lot of Diamond and Masters players. Diamond and Masters players that I've seen, they are good at the game in the sense that they know that micro and unit control is important. And they're good with their mouse, meaning that they know how to click stuff around and make stuff happen. But a lot of times, they go into the fight with a really bad army setup, and then they're frantically trying to micro it into something that ends up being good. So let's look at formation. Sun Tzu said, To control many is the same as to control few. This is a matter of formations and signals. The valiant shall not advance alone nor shall the coward flee. Formation. Even Sun Tzu knew that this was important. Let's make some Roach Hydra, and I'll show you. I'll show you. Okay, so we get our hatches. We'll make some Hydras. Make some Hydras. Get them in the hotkey. Here, create some creep. Why not? Let's make some Roaches now. Let's make some roaches. Boom. Got some roaches. Drones, why are you in the army? Why are you in the army? Please. Okay. So we've got hydras. We've got roaches. Drones, go home. Go home. Now with roaches and hydras... If you think about how the units work, some of these units have longer range than others. Let's look at this. Hydras have five range, unless you upgrade them with grooved spines, and then they get six. So we've got hydras with five to six range, depending on the upgrade. We've got roaches. These have four range. So the roaches should be in front of the hydras, and the lings are melee. So they have to be physically biting or slashing the target to be able to deal damage. Another quick tip here. Yes, Roaches and Hydras do have a melee animation, but it does not benefit from the melee upgrades. It's just an animation. It's still their range stuff. It just looks really cool. That's why it's in the game. So before we're to go into an engagement, we want to have the shortest range units in the front, 
and then the next shortest, and then the longest range units in the back. So we can go on the map, we can kick some butt, we can fight some stuff. Let's get some heckin' Ling speed. So we've got Ling Roach Hydra. This is beautiful. You don't want the salt and pepper stuff is all mixed up. You've got roaches trapped behind hydras. They're trapped. These sad, these sad roaches. They won't even be able to fire. If you get into a fight and you have roaches behind hydras, they're just like, I can't get into the fight. And the hydras are shooting away. But the hydras should all be totally behind. And what you can do is, I think it's control click. Control click your hydras back to the back, stay in the back, and then the lings and the roaches will all tank for that, and you can take a really nice fight. Let's talk about going in against AoE. This is the thing I was mentioning earlier, where people clump up their army. This is like a little kid soccer team, where I have everything in a single clump. That's, that's one clump. The most powerful move that you can do more powerful than micro if you're trying to attack an opponent and represent all of your value is this pay attention did you see that i boxed a big chunk of the army and i clicked it to the side so now i've got two sections of units and i can do stuff like this where I can attack on both sides of this pillar. That means that when I move in, the splash damage is distributed. It's not like my front line is getting totally blown up all at once. I have two front lines and I'm filling the whole area. And the way to make that happen is by just doing this simple box, click some stuff down, select the group, and then you A move. This happens in Roach versus Roach. This happens Basically, any time you're playing with lots of units against fewer units. If you're Protoss and you have a Zealot Archon army and you're against some Banelings, you would get your Zealots, click some down, and then you A-move. And they're not all in one big clump. They're spread out. More important than Micro is just that simple box and then click. If you're playing a bunch of Bio units and you're going in against Ling Bane Hydra, doing this, it could help. So be aware of your formation, be aware of your spread. And a way that you can check this is, say you played a game and you felt like you had the bigger army and you look on the army graph, you did have the bigger army, but you got decimated. That's where you look in the replay and say, when I went into the fray, what was my formation like? Did I have that good spread that I needed so all the units can participate? and I'm not taking unnecessary damage from Splash. Wouldn't this be micro? Not really, because this happens before the fight. Before the fight. And it's not really fancy pants kinds of stuff. This is just one box click and then a click down. So the whole class here is unit management, and a lot of unit management is not the amazing on-the-fly splitting of grabbing your individual units to take good trades in Ling Bane. Like, that's nice, that's great, but the real meat and potatoes of moving up in League is just representing all of your value, making sure every unit can fire, every unit can participate and do its job, and so you don't throw them into a big disruptor shot unnecessarily, which is very sad. <coughs> Oops. Whoops. Okay. Sweet. We did this. Cool. We've got some examples here for each of the three races. We've got, for Zerg, a leading Ling. You can do the same thing with Protoss and Terran, where you have one cheap unit that's fast, that's in the front, that, as Polt was saying, is like a flashlight for your army, where it fills a big circle of vision in front of the army, so you're aware of what dangers can be lurking ahead. Yes, it is dangerous for that unit, but it's gonna be really good for your big host of units to not run into some really dangerous situation. So another thing is attacking Banes in pairs when attacking in Ling Bane Wars. A lot of Ling Bane 
micro or success in the micro stage is based on that formation. Because if you have, say, eight veins in a clump, I had a trade like this yesterday. I think I was defending against a Zerg. They attacked me with 10 veins, and they were all in one huge clump. I just had two, and I moved, commanded them in to the center of the baneling group, and then I automatically detonated them. I blew up all their banes. It wasn't like the opponent microed bad. It was that their formation was bad going into the engagement trying to attack me. <clears throat> we already talked about the ground army split. 5% to follow. We addressed that. Leading Marine, Scouts ahead, this applies to Terran as well. Marines and Hellbats ahead of the more expensive units. That's kind of like the Ling Roach. You can think about it in terms of the less expensive units tend to be more expendable and also cheaper, so you want them at the front. Less, uh, less expensive and cheaper is the same thing. <laughs> Ground Army pre-split when sieging a location. So if you're Terran, and say you want to go siege a base... You can set up your tanks and whatnot at a location, and then instead of having one clump of bio, you just take your time before the battle starts and put a few units here, put a few units there, put a few units there, and then when the banelings roll in, you can make those small adjustments with the stuff, and it's going to look a lot better when you fan out your army, as opposed to having one single clump, and then the banelings come in, and all of your marine units are panicked and don't know where to go. So tank spread to mitigate the effect of blinding cloud is pretty important. You can scout this too, just as a note. If you know the Zerg doesn't have Hive, you obviously don't have to do this because they don't have Vipers and blinding cloud. So that's a good point. <clears throat> that's kind of like pre-splitting for mech. And then Zealot Adept in front of more gas intensive units. There is a note here Unit collision is kind of a, a traffic jam issue you can run into. Ultras and Hydras oftentimes have traffic jam. You want to make sure the Hydras are way in the back, the Ultras are in the front, so that when they go into the fray, you don't have Ultras trapped behind Hydras. For Protoss, Stalkers and Archons tend to trip over each other a decent bit. Archons are shorter range, they should be in the front. Immortals can be behind Archons. Zealots are obviously melee, so they need to be frontline units. Sweet. So sentries with their guardian shield. Guardian shield is awesome, and it's something that it doesn't really require fancy micro. It's one button. You just have one sentry in the middle, and it's kind of like the Gungan army in the Star Wars prequels, where it's like a big bubble of safety or whatever. It reduces the incoming range damage, so you want to make sure that that's going to be covering as much of your army as it can. So generally, the sentry wants to be in the middle. The sentry is also a pretty fragile unit, so you don't want them kind of on the outer fringe of your army so that they're going to get easily killed. Colossus Disruptors in the back, part of this relates to their range. One nice thing about Colossi is they have unit walking, where they can just walk over your army happily, and they're not going to trip over stuff. They're very tall. They also count as air units, so be aware of that. Warp Prism protected to maintain momentum of the push. A lot of the really decisive interactions revolve around the Warp Prism. The Warp Prism got buffed a whole bunch into Legacy of the Void. Its pickup range is better, its movement speed is faster. The downside is it has less hit points now than it did before. So that's the area for counterplay. A lot of times your opponent is going to have their eye on your Warp Prism so you want to make sure that's in a location that is well defended by the rest of your fighting forces. <clears throat> Mothership following a unit. That's the same as I was mentioning before with having your Vipers follow a Hydra in the army so they don't fly ahead. The Mothership is super powerful, super valuable. It cloaks everything. So you want to make sure it's cloaking as much as it can without putting itself at risk. If it flies in the front of the army say a zerg they could abduct that and then focus it down or neural parasite it and it's just a disaster so take good care of that keep it on follow of some backline unit if you can that's some good stuff there so that's formation for the different races and now at long last we can talk about micro 
at the beginning. We talked about how micro is the word on everyone's minds when it comes to StarCraft play. Micro, wow, amazing micro. Look at his micro, wow. Do you see that micro? Yeah, micro is pretty amazing and flashy, but it's gonna really shine when you have all of those other elements we talked about working well for you. So you've got your rallying, the units are in the right place at the right time, they have purpose, they're well organized, they're in control groups that have clear roles and objectives. You've got your position where they're in a good spot on the map, geographically speaking, that relates to your opponent's setup. And they've got a good formation where you have the shorter range units in the front and the longer range units in the back, your fragile units protected. And then you can micro your little heart out. You can do some amazing force field stuff. You can split your units and dodge the baneling hits. You can focus fire the expensive units. Lots of cool stuff with micro, but it's not the first thing that you focus on with StarCraft. That's like one of your finishing moves in this long combo of actions that you've managed with your units over the course of the game. Sun Tzu said, Now an army may be likened to water, for just as flowing water avoids heights and hastens to the lowlands, so an army avoids strength and strikes weakness. So it's visually stunning, wow. Mouse accuracy is a big factor here. Your ability to your ability to click stuff that you want to click, which is easier said than done. A uh, tip here about DPI. A lot of uh, hardware companies market DPI to gamers like it's horsepower of a car, where it's like the more DPI, the better. I don't know all of the, the science about optimizing your mouse DPI, but most StarCraft Pro gamers are gonna use around 800 DPI which is a lot lower than what they're telling you in the commercials of. This new mouse has 6,000 DPI. Oh. Wow. That, that doesn't really help you because you have your mouse on the screen and you're kind of looking around at stuff and then you move it a little bit and it just zooms to the corner of the map or the corner of the screen or it zooms over here and you don't really get that fine-tuned clicking. I use 400 DPI, which is pretty, pretty slow. But that allows me to do really cool stuff, like select individual units. So I can grab a ling, I can grab a ling, I can grab two lings, I can grab three lings, or four, three lings, four, five, or so. That kind of stuff. So it gives me much more control. I do have to move my mouse more. The lower your DPI, the more you have to move your mouse to make stuff happen. So you do want to have a fairly reasonably sized mouse pad. I guess I can show you my mouse pad here. Let's see. I don't know how it's going to interact with the green screen, but it's like a Borderlands. It's pretty big. But it's not massive. I know there are some like FPS mouse pads that are like your whole desk is the mouse pad. I don't think you need that. I mean, snipers in FPS games, I guess, do that kind of thing. But you should find the DPI that works for you. Maybe 400 is too slow for you. Maybe you want to do 200 and just be a boss, but whatever. Maybe you want to have 2,000 DPI. I'm not going to stop you. You do what you want to do. Just be aware that that's a big factor in how well you can click your units as accurately as you want to. <clears throat> okay. So the attack move. The attack move is something that gets joked about and teased a bunch with StarCraft. Goodness gracious, that's, it's silly. It's really silly because that is how you represent your army and tell your fighting units to fight. If someone says, oh, you just attack moved and won, no skill involved. That means the person who's complaining, they fell behind in some capacity or their formation was bad or their position was bad or their composition was bad, they were behind in upgrades. Who knows why they lost, but the beauty of StarCraft, the beauty, the transcendental beauty of when I went from playing poker, which has a lot of chance and variance in the outcomes, where the player who plays the hand better can lose, it doesn't happen in StarCraft II Legacy of the Void. The person who performs better in the match in some crucial ways wins every time. It's wonderful. So if you lost a game, 
you can try to trick yourself and do mental gymnastics and make excuses for yourself, but it was your fault. It was your fault. And the faster you can admit that, the faster you can move into the troubleshooting stage of saying, where did I mess up? Where did I fall behind? And what were my, say, three most crucial things I could work on? Maybe I got supply block beyond all reason for four minutes. Is it fair for me to complain about the state of balance in the game if I was supply blocked for four minutes? No, it's not fair. You're just making excuses for yourself. Take some responsibility. You'll improve a lot faster. Attack move is fine. It's a powerful move for the person who has the bigger, stronger, sturdier army. So if your opponent has a bigger, stronger, sturdier army, that means they out-macroed you. Their build was better, their production was better, their supply management was better, and they get to just crash in and win the game because you fell behind. So the question should be, how do I get ahead? How do I not fall behind? Could I have applied pressure? Is my build not really that optimal? Should I have built more uh, diverse units? Should I have made different units? That kind of stuff. So here are some unit selection things. Box micro left click. I can just show these. I think we addressed most of them before. Let's get back in. Okay, so we've got our box micro. Just the most simple thing. Note that you can do it from different angles. So this is a top left to bottom right box, bottom right. It doesn't matter. Do whatever is comfortable for you. Some people are right-handed. Some people are left-handed. Some people play with one hand. Do whatever. Do whatever. <clears throat> You've got your unit selection, so I just click one unit. Clicking one. Clicking one. Click a hatch. <clears throat> click a drone. What else is there? Uh, control is all units of a given type. That's good to show. <clears throat> Especially if they're strewn about like this. So I just control click the Hydra and it gave me all Hydras on the given screen. Control click all the roaches. Move them here. Control click all the lings. Move them here. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. And we've got shift click. Shift click is a way to add in additional units. So we've got one Hydra. Shift click a Hydra. Now we have two Hydras. Shift click a Hydra, now we have three, four, five, six. These six Hydras. And I want to add a Ling to that. We got a Ling to that. Shift click a Roach. Now we have a Roach with this group. Sweet. Another thing too is say you have a heap of Zerglings and you want to set up a Baneling drop. This could apply to other races as well, but this is just one example. I send the links over here where the overlord is going. Shift click four times. Four, and then I rebind the army without those four. Look at him go. These four links are here. And then I can morph banes, put them in the overlord, and do the drop. So that shift clicking and then rebinding the group with control that I just used. Control shift click, we addressed this before. I will show it again, just so you're aware. Let's say I have my army. Let's say, excuse me, overlay. Let's say I have my army. I select my larva and I make some roaches. Oops, I'm supply capped. I'm supply capped. We need, we need room for activities. I'm sorry. Bible thumb. Okay, okay, that's enough, stop. That's enough, no more needless bloodshed. Okay, so let's get the hatches. And let's make hydras. And let's say we make a couple lings. And then, oops, I bound all of this larva to the army. Oh, crap. So I want to hold down both control and shift. And then I click one of these larva. And they're gone. But now I have to control and rebind the army. So now I don't have the larva in my army. That's control, shift, click. Astounding. Astounding. Oh, we have F2. F2. Okay, here we go. This is a very advanced technical and sacred maneuver that has been passed down for generations. It's this button. You can hotkey this. You push the button. You push the button. And then everything that can fight that is not a queen 
gets selected and then you can press the attack button and then you click on the map. Excuse me, overlay. Excuse me, overlay. You have random stuff selected. Say I have a hatch. I press all army button. It's right here. Whatever the hotkey is, it's listed there. I press the button. I press the button. I press the attack button. Press attack. I click into the enemy's base. Then everything goes. There's your F2. There's your F2. It's a very amazing move. It has some downsides, but sometimes you're just in a frantic situation, a bunch of stuff, maybe it got unbound from your hotkeys, or if you're getting all in and you wanna make sure you have everything, you can push that button, or you can use it all the time. That's your decision to make. Okay. Oops, wrong button. Buttons are hard. It's a good thing we did this class. It's a good thing. Okay, queuing commands. This is pretty nice too. Just your ability to set units on a journey so that they're going to arrive at a location and do their job. Here's an example. We're back in. So I have these links. I'm going to steal them to a group and let's send them around the edge of the map. And then they're going to attack. So I sent these links and now they're on a journey. You see this? And I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything because they're sent. Look, my mouse, my keyboard hand is off and we're just following these. This is shift rally. So I shift move, shift move, shift move, shift attack. That's how you do amazing ling run by or, or zealot run by. Protoss can do this too. Anyone can do this. So yeah, I think we had like one little note that was cut off on the bottom of that. Um, focus fire. That's just boxing several units and then clicking a higher priority target. But yeah, sweet. Sweet. That was the, the material for the notes. So it's been a blast doing this class. We're going to open it up to Q&A in just a minute. Appreciate everyone being here. It is monumental. This is way more viewership than I normally get. I am very humbled and honored that you are here. Welcome. This is my job. I'm a full-time Zerg streamer. But yeah, give me 30 seconds to a minute. I'll be right back, and then we'll do some Q&A with the chat. How does that sound? Q&A. Ask me, ask me anything. Try to keep it StarCraft-related. I know there are a lot of memes on Twitch, but in the spirit of learning about unit management, think about your question. I'll get back, and let's let's tackle some of those.
And we're back. I hear nothing. Are my ears broken? No. No, they're not. You're fine. Okay. Talk to me, fam. Say I have zealots and I want to run by. Should I click them to the enemy drone line or A move? When I A move, they have a chance to attack the hatch, but when I normally move, the zealots attack what will attack them. If I shift right click each drone, they clump up. So you have a couple different options here. And one of the things with StarCraft is the most optimal route is gonna depend on the situation. So if the opponent has fighting units nearby and you don't think you can beat those units, you can just go into the worker line and then hold position. I should actually show that. Hold position is a, a good and very powerful move that I did not discuss because I forgot or I didn't think of it. Hold position, hold position. So say you have zealots. Let's call these, let's call these units zealots. So I can shift move command them in. Say this is a worker line filled with workers. I move command and then I can shift hold position, which means they're just gonna stand and they're gonna use their blades and they're just gonna slice whatever is within range, which will usually be workers. If they pull their workers, you could maybe chase those down or you could kill the hatch. Zealots are strong. They're also good at killing buildings. That's part of their attribute as a unit. You could say adepts are more specialist at killing workers primarily and they're bad at killing buildings. Zealots with upgrades are very good at killing buildings. Let's see, a hold position. Hold position is very strong. If you're Zerg and you're trying to break a siege of Terran, you can get your army here, say this is a bigger army, and you can hold position, select your Viper key. Here, hold position. You select your Viper key and then you abduct stuff into this hold position area. That way the vipers, or sorry, the, the hydras and roaches aren't spilling in and getting blown up by tanks. They're just standing there and they're waiting for the next abducted unit to come over and then they'll shoot it. So a hold position unit will attack any enemy unit that comes within range. So for uh, zerglings and zealots, that would be melee. For roaches, that would be if they come within four range, hydras five to six range. You get the idea. Thank you, that was a helpful question. Which hotkeys are best to use? Grid and core are both good. You could also make a custom hotkey setup. Uh, I may do a mechanics class at some point. That wasn't really the focus of today's. Standard is viable. You have top level pro players who some of them use standard and they modify it. Some of them use grid. I think Snoot uses grid or something similar to that in principle. Uh, Showtime uses the core. I use the core, Pig uses the core. Um, yeah, a lot of players use fairly standard setup. A lot of the top Korean pros, and I think Cyril use something similar to standard, and they use the F keys for their camera locations. So they jump from their bases by hitting F1, F2, F3, that kind of thing. Tips on formation or micro to minimize damage from bio storms, aside from pre-split. So to look at the next step of what that would be like, let's say we have the army Let's say we have the army, and it is pre-split, and we're kind of going into the fray here. Say we're going in, and this stuff is attacking, and the disruptor shot comes in. You can watch where the shot is coming in. Box the units and run away. Box the units and run away. Back up. Back up. But it needs to be those small little adjustments, because you only need to move the size of units that the disruptor shot could hit. You don't have to move everything. Like sometimes people see a disruptor shot and they get their army group and they just move everything. It's not necessary. Same thing for storms. You can attack in and you see a storm here, so I pull units away from that. I see a storm here, I pull the units away from that. I see a storm at the front, I pull the units away from that. See? With Biles, you usually want to do a similar kind of backing up move as opposed to moving forward. The reason for that is if you move forward into the enemy, you're going to receive a lot of damage. There is an exception. If you have a way bigger army, you can oftentimes just push through. So it is situational. <clears throat> what does shift attacking look like and what does it do? 
Well, that's basically when you have units that are given an attack command somewhere down the chain of commands. So you have your group of units and you give them a move command, shift move command, shift attack. So they'll go to a place without attacking anything. And then once they get to that point, they get an attack command. What does it look like? We did it earlier, but I can just do one really fast for you. So move, 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 attack. I just held down shift throughout that whole process. And I hit the move hotkey, click the ground, hit the move hotkey, click the ground, hit the attack key, click the ground. And they're attacking here now. Terran question, how can I optimize my 16 marine pick when they're surrounded by lings and the medivac is not above the marines? You gotta pick up and get out of there. The 16 marine pressure is primarily for creep spread. It's one of those things where you have some dedicated fighting units, but it's possible that your opponent has more than enough to defend. So you're gonna wanna try to use that to distract your opponent and to maybe clear some creep but not necessarily to expect to win the game outright or to kill them with that. 16 Marine Double Medivac Pressure is not a killing move. It's not a killing build. It's an opener that is pretty safe, and it can create some advantages if the opponent cuts corners. But I think at a lot of levels of play, the defender is not going to have the most optimal defense. Oftentimes, they'll over-defend which that ends up being your own kind of advantage where you can get ahead economically and in tech and race them to 200 supply. Because if they have a low economy because they overreacted to your 16 Marines, you can just pick up and get the heck out of there, keep your units alive, and maybe go for a 2-2 timing attack. Use the steel control group to a dumb group on individual links for scouting. Should I learn cloning shift deselect instead I'm not sure what you mean by cloning shift deselect like cloning as in copying that group to another group I don't do that if you're just scouting with lings I mean they're not gonna be able to do another thing at the same time what's the basic zerg build order there's a starter kit command you can use that has a lot of those basic zerg things for how to macro up we have tons of Tons of content on the YouTube channel. Why is Storm better than the entire Zerg race? Storm ends up being really strong against Zerg because Zerg swarms with large numbers of units and Storm is really good against that. The thing that Zergs often fail to do is get their Broodlord transition happening fast. So we've had some developments in the meta of you've got Zergs who figured out, wow, Hydra's got a health buff, Bane's got a health buff, Hydra Bane is amazing, let's do that. That's cool. Protoss noticed this. Anyone who's played Protoss, you probably are aware that Hydra's and Bane's are now part of the matchup. And they realized that Storm is a really elegant solution to that problem. So a lot of times, they'll open up with a quick Templar Archives on two bases as they're taking their third, Maybe they do some Archon Harass, but they can just get into this zone where they have their third, they're taking their fourth, and they have two things they're doing. Spend my gas into High Templar, spend my minerals into Zealots. If they have all High Templar and Zealots, wow, that's amazing. And if you attack into them with Mass Hydra, you're going to have a terrible time because that's exactly what Zealots and High Templar are good at fighting. But say 12 Broodlords show up with a bunch of support. Suddenly that Zealot High Templar is outclassed and they can't do crap to that. And it's just going to die. They need to transition. So you should be able to respect when a Protoss invests really hard into High Templar. There are some downsides to that. They're slow. They're fragile. There's a lot of stuff that High Templar can't do. They can't shoot air units. Okay. Well, the chat is moving so fast. I can't even scroll up for some of the questions. Astounding. Zerg, what do I do against Mass Battlecruiser and Mass Thor? 
You can use vipers to pull them into a spore field, or you can use infestors with burrow and neural parasite and take over them and then teleport the battlecruisers into the spore field and kill them. What's one piece of advice for an individual player to give to a diamond player? You need to hit 70 workers. A 70 worker economy is the standard three to four base setup so that you can hit 200 supply, take some fights and remax. Any advice for defending harass like Hellions? Uh, well, watch the minimap as one and then fill vision outside of your bases so that you can see those moving into your base. Additionally, you should have some dedicated defense at home. If you see that it's a Hellion opening, they could potentially jam them in. So you can have some dedicated defense that's ready for that to happen and you watch the minimap like a hawk so you're ready and then you can kill them. Worker Micro against Disruptor Shots. Well, it's just the splitting exercise. There's a nice arcade game called the Marine Split Challenge. Even if you're not a Terran player, that can be a really good space to exercise splitting your units frantically against some splash, just in a way where you can repeat that process over and over again. One thing that is an issue for a lot of people playing StarCraft is you have these fundamentals, and sometimes a given fundamental only comes up once every 12 games which means you don't really get high quality practice on that. So you can do drills to really get those. Can you explain how to use queen injects with location hotkeys? Sure, I mean, it's it's basically just that. So let me bind my cameras. This is base one, two, three, four, five. Oops, yeah, five. Cool, one, two, three, four, five. So then let's make sure there's a queen at each of these. All these drones, they've mined out the bases. We've just had this game open for 40 minutes. So base one, I just select the queen. I can box it or I can click it. Inject the hatch. One nice tip is having them all at the same position relative to the hatchery. So say the hatchery is a, a clock, a 12 hour clock. Having the queens at 10 o'clock means I can do a box micro from the same spot at every base. There's no queen in this base, oops. That's it, makes it really easy so you don't have to go find the queen. The hunt for the wandering queen. You can even do this too, just hold down shift and then click your hatch repeatedly and the queen will unload her energy into that hatch. And this is on a timer too, it's not like you inject the hatch five times, and then when the timer finishes, five larva or five injects of larva pop off. It's going to be one cycle of larva, and then the cooldown starts again. And then it'll start again and again, and you get three per time. I think there's maximum of 18 larva. I'm not sure. Maybe this is the max. So 19. Something like that. What are my camera hotkeys? Uh, alt. I use the core, so it's alt. You have trouble as Zerg dealing with drops from Terran in the early mid game. So as Zerg against Terran, this is the thing that I see Rogue do. Rogue streamed a little bit. He does this. Two spores in the main, like so. So if they zoom in with a bunch of medivacs from the side here, like they're Indiana Jones, these spores will shoot at them, and spores deal really nice anti-air DPS. You can even get a queen to help shoot the medivacs. Additionally, you can just get some lings. Another a good number is probably 12. I think that's what a lot of pro players recommend. And do this, patrol command, patrol. So I shift move commanded, and then shift patrol. So if you see a Terran, that's about to boost into your base, and they boost into this, they're gonna have a bad time. Because whenever a unit gets unloaded, all the lings will pounce on it, and the spores are shooting the medivacs, this is just nasty for Terran to drop into. What can we do in a Protoss is turtling on two base <clears throat> and stopping most of our scouting? Do you try and break through or macro at home? 
Well, the first thing I would do probably if it's a two base turtle where they don't they don't attack you, but they're still on two bases, is you want to get like get where you're sitting upright, where your shoulders are kind of back, and you breathe in, <laughs> and then you laugh. You laugh because you know that the key power spike for Zerg is three bases injected, 70 drones, 200 supply. And if they're turtling on two bases, they can't stop you. So you just laugh and max out. You laugh to yourself and get hive for broodlords. <clears throat> Any common mistakes you notice Terrans do? Uh, a lot of Terrans I see tend to over micro their units like they stutter step a little bit more than is necessary. The thing that always kind of makes me um, disappointed is when you have a Terran who doesn't transition into their late game, they keep making Marines and Marines and Marines and they have three bases of gas and they have 2.5K gas in the bank what they need to be doing is make liberators. So add a couple star ports for liberators and then add a ghost transition. Increase your tank count, make some Thors. You need to make more gas rich units in the late game. That's like the macro issue I see from Terrans really often. Key spots to use camera locations other than expos. Some people use uh, camera locations for watchtowers. I just use them for bases. Are Lurkers a good alternative to Broods against Storm? I mean, they're not as good, but they're better than Hydras. Lurkers have more range than High Templar with Storm, so they do have a, a zoning relationship there. One piece of advice, however general, you would give to a Diamond player who had a plateau. Oh, I think I just answered that. 70 drones, 70 workers, whatever your race is. Get your fourth base at 8 minutes. Don't get supply blocked at 36. It's a lot of those simple things, right? Being in Masters is about having a ridiculously crisp early game. It should be crisp and perfect for the first few minutes because there's usually nothing going on. A lot of times people are stuck in a, a lower league because their opening is not efficient. So if you're, if you're Diamond and you're against a Masters 3, 2, or 1 player, in the first four minutes, usually the diamond player has made mistakes that put them behind for the rest of the game. So you should be really, really, really uh, precise about what you're doing early on. Uh, I already answered the question about dealing with drops. Did you miss that? Oh, wait. Have we been pasting stuff again? What is an effective way to populate the first gas? Usually, the most standard opening build order is hatch gas pool, where you go 17 hatch, and then you rally the next egg into a gas, and then the next egg to build a pool. Use the starter kit command, and you can check out um, a solid Zerg build class. I did a whole class on that question in particular. Any tips for throwing fungal chains? Well, having the infestors on their own hotkey is uh, a good one, making sure that they're not going to run into the fray and get shot. But you can do some counting. That's one of the few areas of StarCraft where I feel like counting either aloud to yourself or in your head can help you. So fungal lasts for, what, four seconds? So you have your infestor hotkey, you see the clump of units, you fungal, one, two, three, fungal and that way you'll always keep them slowed can you show us the core configuration camera hotkeys and hotkeys please that would take an abundant amount of time quite a large amount of time I'll probably do a mechanics class that's one that we could do an entire class on how to defend early cyclones pressure as protoss couple shield batteries at home is the new way that Protoss deals with harassment. It extends the life and survivability of your units at home. Or you could shield battery attack them with a one base build. A lot of Protoss players do that every game. 
As a low league Protoss, you die to two base all ins. If I try to get my natural, I find myself without enough units to hold. This is kind of a common misconception because a lot of times people will be expanding late already and then they take their base and they get attacked and they feel like that was an unsafe decision when usually you can squeeze out your base way earlier than that. So I would look at something like Pig. He has some guides on some basic build orders for when to expand and whatnot. Killing an expansion is hard work. They have tons of HP. So if you're losing your expansions, that means that you fell really far behind. In StarCraft, you have Defender's Advantage, which is the time it takes for your opponent's army to go from their home base and walk and walk and walk and walk and walk over to you and attack you. So if they made some stuff and they walked all the way across the map and then they killed you, that means either you didn't scout, you didn't know what to do against the attack, you built the wrong type of units, or your build was just inefficient and you were just behind. So I would really investigate what your opening looks like and some good expansion timings. The third base for Zerg should go down at around three minutes, three minutes to 3.30 at the latest, assuming kind of normal macro circumstances. Even if someone's going for a big two base timing, use the third for larva and that kind of thing. Don't be scared to expand. Don't be scared. Be bold. Expanding is a very decisive choice. It creates a big point of contention on the map, and it's hard to kill a base. So it's a powerful move to expand. You shouldn't be scared of that. If you die, you can review it in the replay, see what you could have done differently. If a cannon rush kills your natural, what's the best response? Well, usually the first response is to be sad, but then you would get a second gas and a roach warren and a lair, and you can go for a nidus play in their main. That's a good option, or you can make ravagers and use corrosive bile to bust the contain. Efficient way to do creep spread. I spread my two. Okay, I'll show you that. So the first thing is to have your queens on their own hotkey, the ones that are not injecting. So I have some queens here. I have some queens here. In the most optimal case, we get queens and we put them at the very last edge of creep. We just hit the queen group, make a tumor, make a tumor. Now one thing that I've picked up from watching Cyril is he does rapid fire creep. Let's say, for example, use your imagination. Everyone put on your imagination helmets or hats or whatever, sombreros. Imagine the double medivac marine just zoomed over here. They zoomed over here, they unloaded, and they're coming up, and they scan. They scanned, and they killed this creep tumor. They killed the creep tumor, and we're all very sad. And then they pick up, and they zoom over here. When they pick up and leave, that's when Cyril does this. He holds down shift, and he holds down the creep tumor button with rapid fire. And look, it's, it's a creep tumor celebration. And now it's just a big wave of creep. It's not just one tumor, it's an abundance of tumors. And each of these tumors has 50 hit points. So for them to clear this again, they have to represent 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, 350, 400, 450, 500 points of damage to clear up this mess. This is a mess. You could even do more. I mean, there's a point where it gets a little bit excessive, but you get the idea. And then now you can do other stuff, such as this. I'm doing this. Wow, look, I did this and this. And I moved this, and I did this. And look at them. They're still just... They're still just running around, just... Just creeping the ground. You see that? Wow. Creep spread. Are disruptors viable versus lurkers? That's kind of a, a personal preference thing. Immortals are so good against lurkers that it's kind of like, why, why make it harder on yourself and have to micro a unit? You struggle with hotkey management regarding unit stealing when being dropped. 
Okay, well, we just talked about that. This is one of those things that it's a classic question that is never going to go away. But we did this before. We just have these units and they stay here. These lings stay here. They could stay here for the whole game. How much supply is this? This is 12 lings. This is 6 supply. Each ling is half a supply. 6 supply is not going to turn the tide when you're attacking on the Terran side of the map. If you can beat their army, you can beat their army. You don't need these 12 lings. It'd be much better to have them at home when the Terran realizes, uh-oh, I don't have liberators and ghosts for your ultra transition, so I'm going to base race you, and all the medivacs boost over here. You just have this. Do this. Make it easy on yourself. Are these classes, like, regular? Kind of. This is high effort content, meaning that I have to prepare, first of all, what the class is going to be about. I have to think about how to lump that into some cohesive lesson plan, and then I have to present that in a way that makes sense, which takes hours. And I type up the notes, and I think about what I'm going to talk about. It's not one of those, like, a randomly crack open the stream and start talking about stuff. This is prepared material. So it's not like I'm going to do this every day. We have lots of other classes on the YouTube channel in the classes playlist. When is it best to start taking gases as Zerg? Complex question. Here's the simple answer that's not always right, but it's a good rule. You take your first gas when you have one base saturation. You take your second gas when you have two base saturation. You take the rest of your gases up to six when you have three base mineral saturation. What does Sun Tzu say about cannon rushing? Well, a lot of Protoss stuff doesn't really apply to Sun Tzu because it has super amazing technology. Like, air units were not in the art of war. Teleportation is not in the art of war. Uh, warping in buildings in the opponent's base. Ancient China, that did not happen. So he's not going to have talked about that. People are dazzled at the viewer count. I welcome you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Blizzard, for promoting this in the launcher. It's a huge help. I'm very hyped and inspired and all that. Any advice for positioning with Terran Battle Mech? We talked about that before. You can check this out in the VOD. If you're against Vipers, you want to pre-split your tanks when you siege them up. You want to have the Hellbats in the front so they can absorb a bunch of damage. Because they're cheaper and more expendable. I do rapid fire creep too. Am I as good as Serral? No, you are not. Neither am I. What is a good strategy to beat Skytoss as Zerk? 2-2 two, two Queen Hydra Max out. Can you talk about Zerk's late game versus Ghost Liberator? Sure. 5 spores, 5 over sorry, 5 spores, 5 to 7 brood lords, and then a ton of Ling Bane with overseers. That would be how you still push in despite them having Ghost Liberator. Also Nidusing Lings in the main. Aren't a lot of Lurkers good versus Immortals too, right? Kind of. It depends on a lot of stuff. Critical mass of Lurkers. If you have 17 Lurkers and there are 4 Immortals, of course you're going to win. But it gets kind of dicey because Immortals have that 100 HP shield. And they deal bonus damage to Armored. So if the Immortals have Detection, and maybe the High Templar also Storm them, and they have an upgrade advantage, sometimes the Lurkers can lose. Your army should be protecting the Lurkers. People are still dazzled at the viewer count. The timer on the war chest giveaway is done. Thank you for letting me know. Can I improve to become GM by using F2 all the time? Yes, there are many people who have done this. You don't have to emphasize control groups and that kind of stuff. You can find your own way to move up the ladder. I'm behind in the chat, so a lot of times I see people posting a question multiple times. I'm I'm scrolling down. Yeah, 6k is more than we've gotten for the previous classes. I think we got 1 to 2k for a lot of the other ones.
What is it about Zerg that makes you play it as your main race? Well, I just wanted to learn Zerg for the for the Heart of the Swarm campaign. So before that was coming out, I was a young silver Zerg, just trying to make bugs and get into gold league and stuff. So I did that. And then I just ended up sticking with it. I liked Zerg so much. I really like the way the mechanics feel. I've talked about this a lot on my stream. The three races in StarCraft are more similar than they are different. Yes, they have unique elements regarding the mechanics of injects versus creep spread and chrono boost and orbital command energy and stuff like that. But I need to turn this volume down. There's a sub train coming through. I can't even hear it. It's like when you have your window right next to a train station and you're trying to talk to someone as <laughs> When is this train going to be over? I'm very appreciative. Thank you, everyone. I will shout people out once we're done talking about this. Would you investing? Would you recommend investing time in learning the core? I would say that's on the scale of effort. The lowest effort would be to just use the standard stuff that they give you in the game by default. Medium effort would be doing grid. High effort would be using core. The core is, I think, technically speaking, the most optimal, but it will also take the most time to learn. So. You should find what fits your preferences. Some people are just going to standard hotkey F2 up the ladder. That's fine if you like doing that. <clears throat> How do you control and hotkey a late game army? You hotkey important units. Well, yeah, the, we address this in detail in the class. Check out the YouTube video. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. I will export this class tonight. If you want to see it right now, my VODs are not paywalled. You don't have to sub to watch the VOD, but you can sub and also watch the VOD. And just go to videos on my Twitch page, and then you can watch this class from the beginning. How do you deal with proxy three barracks with tanks? What? That's a build? That's not a, a optimal or ideal opening that happens at a high level. I don't think I've ever seen that. There was a one base Terran all in meme that was popular like a year ago. A year to a year and a half ago that would be Marines, tanks, one medivac, and a couple liberators. But if you're against one base economy of an all-in, usually you can have one and a half bases economy of Ling, Roach, Ravager, Queen, and Defend. Is StarCraft free? Yes, the multiplayer is free to play. As of November... Was it November of last year or the year before? I think it was last year. As Zerg, I struggle against multiple location drop from Terran. Here. Here, where's the drones? Do that. You see the dead space? This is where the drops zoom around. You have a spore here. If they fly over, the spore shoots it. If they fly over, the spore shoots it. If they fly over, the spores shoot it. Couple spores. What is your thought process when an opponent catches you off guard? I would probably, if they caught me off guard, I would probably go, ah! How do you fight off tilt? Uh, very carefully. What's going on in your head? Chaos. <clears throat> do you think there should have been queen hotkey for us? Uh, I think some people talked about that before. I'm very happy with the way that the game works right now. So, I don't know. I'm not really dissatisfied. I feel like the reason that I'm not... 6k MMR is because of the flaws in my own play. In ZVZ, when your opponent gets ultras and you don't have them already, what do you do? Flip a table. 
Um, make Broodlords. Base race. Ultras are not that amazing against Mass Lurker. Sometimes they could win, but really it's Ultra Viper that could push in. How can I deal with multi-pronged Terran attacks, like Libs in the main and Blue Flame in the third? Well, one Spore in the main, the natural and the third at 4 minutes 30 is standard. You can have one queen that you leave in the main, so it's one queen and one spore versus one liberator. Who wins that fight? And then at the third base, you have your Ling Roach queen, like your creep spread queens, and then you beat the blue flame hellions. ZVT is a hard matchup. A lot of their opening builds are multi prong attacks. Good luck. Hi, Neuro. In ZDZ, I find myself going for hatch gas pool, 16 drones on minerals, 3 on the gas. Ling speed, Bane nest, non-stop production with two queens. I've hit a plateau and would like to macro, but tend to lose to all ins. Are you not taking a third at 30 supply? Because you can afford a third with that build. You can drop a Roach Warren at 3 minutes 40, and then drone after you make your first round of Ling Bane. How do you deal with pro That's the third time you've asked that question. Am I that behind in the chat? What's the best way of getting Crocid Biles onto Vikings without getting shot down? Well, you could ask the Vikings nicely to stop flying around. Or you could use Corruptors to fight the Vikings. Or Hydra Viper. Crocid Bile against Viking is not a reliable matchup for the Ravagers. That's kind of like hoping the Terran is not going to pay attention. When do you stop building one queen per injectable base? Well, at a high level, you can usually get by with three queens injecting in a macro hatch and then a fifth. And the reason for that is by the time you're at a fifth base of economy, you're making hive tech units, which are more larva efficient, like ultras and broodlords. So you don't need as many larvae as you did when you're making Ling Bane and stuff. We talked about the spellcasters not dying. Send them to follow a hydra or one of the backline units in your army. Oftentimes they are going to die when casting and stuff. Keeping them alive is good, but sometimes if they really commit hard to focusing them down, say with the Vikings, you're going to lose them. But you want to try to get their spells off. Another thing you could do is send them in from an unexpected angle. So you could use your Vipers to follow the Hydras across the map. And then once the Hydras are about ready to engage, the Vipers can go from like a side angle and then drop the Blinding Clouds can catch them off guard sometimes. Any reason why many people don't build queens for macro hatch or fourth base? Well, it's like I just said with the hive tech units, they're more larva efficient. Is this an all time high on this channel? I think yes, at least for a sustained viewer count. Thank you Blizzard for the launcher promotion. Do you think GG is proper etiquette and therefore not GG BM? No, I think GG is proper etiquette, and not GGing is just not doing the etiquette, but it's not BM. Just like zero is not a negative number. It's the zero point. It's in the center, where it's not good manner, and it's not bad manner. I think it says something about the player oftentimes being grumpy about how the match played out, but it's not disrespectful. There are a lot of ways to BM in StarCraft. And not GGing, I would say, is... It's not practicing the etiquette, but it's also not attacking the opponent, personally, with words. derp 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 what are the timings for the first four CCs? Woo, ask a Terran streamer. Usually you go barracks for a Reaper and then make an expand in a lot of your Terran matchups. And then you can take your third CC at maybe four minutes. You could build that in your natural wall, three to four minutes, or you can build it in your main. The nice thing about Terran command centers is they can fly. So you can move them later on when it's safe to establish the base. 
How will you celebrate today's success after the stream? Um, with uh, a great amount of joy, gratitude, and happiness. I don't have any particular plans for celebration. I was just trying to plan to help the class go well. One thing at a time. Can you show how to deal with cannon rushes as Zerg? Two drones per probe, two to three drones per probe, four drones per cannon. If they commit multiple probes and build like six buildings, sometimes you're gonna lose the base. You can cancel it in proxy hatch or nidus. The cannon rush scenario has a lot of variety to it and it involves a lot of skill. There's no one simple answer for stopping cannon rush in general. How do you feel about Cyril saying you need four spores per base to defend Liberator Harass? Did he say that? I never watch my replays, but what should I look at? Worker count timings. Yeah, look at your... Oh, I would say look at your production uptime. Make sure all of your workers are doing something. All of your structures are actively producing something that your supply management is good. A lot of times when people give games to me for analysis, they get supply blocked really bad early on and it just puts them in an awkward position for the rest of the game. And then at the end, they'll be like, ah, I just can't beat Storm. You were supply blocked at 36 for 45 seconds and you fell ridiculously far behind. Storm had maybe nothing to do with the overall outcome. It was just the mechanism that was used to punish you for your mistake early. Thought process on the beginning of ZVP. Well, if you're confident in your drone control, you can hatch first. I hatch first even if I know I'm against a cannon rusher some of the time. And stuff you can do, if I can give you some in-game examples, where are my drones? Okay. I don't want I don't want a ton. Let's just get like this many. Okay, so let's say this is my main. I've got my drones. Let's say the Protoss is setting up a cannon rush like here. One thing you can do if you want to be super safe is get one drone and patrol it like right here. So it's hard for the probe to build a structure to start the cannon rush. And another thing would be you get two drones, right click a probe, and there's a second probe, get two to three drones, right click a probe. And then if they drop the buildings, get four, groups of four and attack the pylon or the cannon. And you can also do shift rally because if you use workers to kill a structure, as soon as it dies, the workers stop attacking. So if you want them to continue attacking, you could attack a pylon and then shift to attack another building like a cannon or a probe. So that's basically some of the, the elements of defending cannon rush. You do want to get your pool down and your gas. And then whenever your pool is done, you can make lings. Sometimes a spine can help, but it's kind of break even. I'm five minutes behind the chat. Really? Five minutes? What should I scout with my Reaper versus Zerg? The gas timing, the pool timing, and the number of links and the third base timing. What kind, kind of time do you hit an aim booster challenge? Usually I hit 300 targets and then I'm kind of satisfied to go. You deserve every viewer you get, thank you. One dollar resub next month for gifted subs in September? I didn't know about that. I guess I could mention it. One dollar resubs in September. Okay, now I know. <laughs> now you know. What are good websites to learn about different builds and strategies? Uh, there are a lot of other hardworking streamers like myself who make that kind of content to answer all of those questions. You've got your big random streams, and help me out if you want to recommend other people that I don't think of. I'm tired. I'm not going to remember everybody. Loco Pig and Winter are the big three random streamers. I believe Roddy plays random sometimes. He doesn't really build his YouTube content for guides and stuff, though. But, uh... Pig has guides for all three races, Loco does, and Winter does as well. I have Zerg material primarily, and then I have mindset stuff, and then classes like this, which apply to all three races. 
Was I a rager tilter in my early days? Yes, actually. I would say... Maybe not as toxic and vile as some people, but I did play Han online, and I did say some mean things to people. Like, heck off, but I would use swear words. <clears throat> but yeah, it, it's frustrating losing at video games. The thing that I've uh, basically built in as Neuro, which has changed me as a person, is identifying as a mannered player. Someone who is well-mannered and respectful, so that if I saw the person face to face, I acknowledge they're my opponent in this game, and I'm happy that they're sharing in this competitive experience with me. And after the match, we're human people who share the same hobby, so I'm not gonna be a pooper scooper and be super rude to them. Because a lot of people, they hide behind the anonymity and the safety of being on the internet, and they say a bunch of nasty stuff that would get them into a lot of physical trouble if they said that to a bunch of big people at a, a bar, for example. So that's a that's a big aspect of the arc of at least my gaming. I think I've been a happier gamer than some people. Some people, when they start playing the game, they're already grumpy. I tend to be pretty optimistic, so that helps with the tilt management. But it does take concentrated effort. There are situations where I'll lose to something, and it will rustle my jimmies. A whole bunch but I just I concentrate my will and I say GG well played or well done or something like that because the opponent did wrest the victory for me right maybe it wasn't in the way that I would prefer to lose but it's part of how the game works and I accept that how much is too much static defense early mid game is Zerg uh, it depends a whole bunch on your preference to the matchup. High-level players will do the absolute bare minimum, but for your average-level player who's in a mid-league, do whatever you want. It's not really going to hurt you that much. The more important thing is having a good economy of 60 to 70 workers. Any big changes in your build when playing against 1-1-1 and 2-1-1? 2-1-1... I can defend with queens and lings with a bane nest after double upgrades. Against 1 1 1, usually you want lair and a bane nest or lair and a roach warren because they can have more tech with that. When I go broodlords, their viking kill them, and when I try to fight them with corruptors, they kill that with Thor, and I try and fester and viper. This is sounding like you're behind in upgrades. Because if you have a well-rounded army composition, and the opponent has a well-rounded army composition, and they have defender's advantage, and you have equal army value, you're probably going to lose the fight. So a big part of being successful in the engagement is the total of the factors, right? It's not just one thing. And StarCraft is not rock, paper, scissors, where just because you have a couple counter units to their units doesn't mean you're going to win. If they have a lot better of the elements we already discussed, of organization, formation, their economy behind it is better, their position is better, those kinds of things. Loco is mostly Zerg too. That's definitely his best. Beastie Cutie. Who's your favorite pro gamer, Korean and non-Korean? Uh, I mean, it's really hype seeing Serral kind of be the historic Zerg. Neeb is pretty fun to cheer for, too. He really captured the attention of the community, I think, when he was against Hydra at DreamHack Austin a while back. The crowd was going wild. I became a Neeb fan then. Yeah, I like Rogue for Korean players. There are so many fantastic players in the StarCraft scene. The cannon shot uphill against my spine. Oftentimes they put a probe or a stalker on the ramp so the cannon can see up. Oh, the $1 sub is only for people who are gifted a sub. 
Thank you for telling me. Now you know. Ever feel weak to DTs as a Zerg? Uh, DTs are strong units, but they're pretty expensive. What if a player calls you a piece of S asterisk 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 after you wrecked him? Is that BM? Obviously. How many workers do you make? You make workers until 4 minutes 30 and then you make lings. Neeb! How to shoot infested Terrans fast versus carriers and not get stormed? Well, the first thing is you ask the Protoss very nicely to not build High Templar and storm your infested Terran, and then you use Rapid Fire Invested Terran. Ultras are the counter to Carrier High Templar. Ultras with upgrades. Do you think BC are trash units like some Terrans say? If you are at a GSL level, maybe BC are not in the best spot right now. For everyone else, they're fine. Go watch Nathanius, he makes them pretty often. He can make them work at a GM level, which means that if you're in Platinum, you can make them work too. Do you miss Jadong in the SC2 scene? No. He's more successful in StarCraft 1. He's back and he's kicking some butt. I'm really proud of him. I'm glad that he's doing what he's really good at. My favorite way to cheese my opponent is Zerg. There are lots of different fun things you can do. Proxy hatch, uh, Nidus attacks, Ling Bane busts. How are Ultras the, the counter to Carriers and Storm? Well, because Ultras have the highest armor of any unit in the game, I believe. And if you think about how attacks work versus armor, the armor mitigates for every individual attack. And a carrier is one unit with eight units inside of it that all shoot fast. Which means the Ultra gets the most absurd value for their army. When all those tiny interceptors are basically throwing pebbles at a brick wall, it's not doing nothing. And High Templar against Ultras, I don't even need to explain that. When will you participate in a tournament? I have played in hundreds of tournaments, maybe maybe in the thousands at this point. I'm primarily a streamer, so that's how I make my living. I play in tournaments whenever the WCS Challenger for NA comes around, I take a crack at it. I've gotten one round away from being Challenger, but I've not been a Challenger player yet. If I wanted to, Get in Challenger League, I would need to spend some off-stream practice time. It is very, 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 very distracting answering all these questions and stuff when it comes to just purely optimizing your gameplay. Because if you think about it, the people who are StarCraft tournament professionals are all racing against each other in real time. StarCraft is an RTS, and every day has 24 hours. So if they want to post good results at Montreal, or the next big tournament, they need to be working hard now to get on top of their understanding of the matchups. And what am I doing? I'm doing a unit management class in Q&A, which I think has a great place in the StarCraft scene. But that's putting me even further behind Serral right now, who's in the frozen wasteland of Finland, just hammering away at his keyboard and kicking everyone's butt. See that? Time is precious. Spend your time in ways that matter to you. And you can't have everyone spend their time and everything at the same time. So just as a note, be respectful and mindful when you see one of your favorite casters playing a game and maybe they dip out of GM for a little bit. Are you really gonna hassle them about dipping out of GM when they just flew around outside the country casting these events so that you can enjoy the cast and then they're streaming for you? Jeez. Keep it real. Be respectful. Okay? 
Should I, as over 30 years old, play Diamond or go for Pro Gamer Kappa? I know of 30-plus-year-old uh, gamers who have been Masters 1 to GM level. <clears throat> if a pro StarCraft player plays for 8 hours per day, how much time do they cook? Most of them probably play for more than 8. 12 hours of sleep? 12 hours is a lot of sleep. Are you a bear? Some people maybe need 12 hours, but that seems extreme. Usually they say 8. I feel pretty good after 8. 9 is like the most that I would need unless I did a 24-hour stream. 12 hours of sleep. Hibernation. Well, cool. Mass Air answered that already. I highly recommend people, if you like this content, uh, check it out on the YouTube channel when it's up. Many, many, many of these questions were answered over the course of the class. One of the unfortunate downsides of it being a streamed class is people just stream into the classroom. So you're, you're in the lecture hall giving the lecture about how to build, actually, Hang on, hang on, we can fix this. We can fix this. Is this the one? Um, oh, this is it, this is it, hang on. Hang on here. Okay, great. Hang on, okay, perfect. So uh, the thing is we started this class and then a bunch of people filter in, and maybe you didn't get the beginning of the class. And just for the sake of my own sanity, please just watch the VOD of the beginning of the class. As opposed to me answering a question that I already scripted into the notes and answered as part of the lesson plan. But yeah, big ups to Blizzard for getting me in the launcher for this. I'm very grateful for that. A recap on the board. Well, this was the the set of the topics, the subtopics. So unit management, you've got rallying, organization, position, formation, and micro. One sixty APM is not very low for your progress. Usually, increasing your game knowledge and knowing what to focus on is going to cause your APM to rise naturally. People think that APM is like your ability to spam fast, like you need to be a fast person, like, <laughs> like <laughs> super fast. But usually people get trapped in indecision and that's bogging their progress down because it's like, uh, what do I do here? It's not that they're slow as individuals. Maybe some people have slower reflexes than others, but generally it's going to be because people don't know what to focus on. Because if you really know what to focus on and what you're going to focus on after that, you go from one task to the next, to the next, to the next. And your APM goes right up from 100 to 200 to 300. If you're in the 300 plus range, increasing it gets pretty big diminishing returns, I think. Unless you're GSL Code S. If there's anyone from GSL Code S watching, welcome. I don't know why you're here. Are you trying to help me? Do you have help for me? What do I do versus mass ling bane aggression? Counterattack with your lings and defend with banes. How high can I climb with 100 APM? GM. I think Goody is one of the players who's most renowned for having the lowest APM. He's a mech Terran player. Was it Elfie? Was that his name? There was a Protoss who also had super low APM. Zerg APM tends to just be higher because you hold down the Zergling key and you get tons of units coming out. You don't think APM is super important. I think you're important. So take that. 